Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. We're on there, yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to thought. I just thought the, the, the welcome team are meeting in a, a couple of weeks' time for breakfast. Could the welcome team stand up, please? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to, yeah. I just thought it really wow. All these people welcoming, and that's great, isn't it? Let's the rest of us just give them a round of applause for the work that they do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. It's really good. One of the things we know now as in our church is being a welcoming church. When Susan and I, uh, we grew up in a little chapel in, uh, in Fence Houses. Anybody know where Fence Houses is? Yeah, some of you do. And um, there's a little chapel there called Independent, the Independent Methodist Church. It used to be nicknamed Knighton's Chapel because um, the predominant family there were the Knightons. And so people did that in those days, didn't they? If there was a big family in a church, it always got known as that chapel. Um, and there was a man on the doorway there, he was, called, he was an Oliver actually, and we used to call him Uncle Joe. And when Susan and I got married, he was the welcomer on the door. And he was an amazing guy who loved him to bits and spent a lot of time with him. But when he went in and he welcomed you, he got a hold of your hand and he shook your hand. And then he stood and you used to think, okay, yeah, and then and, and, and you thought it went on forever, but he always had some questions to ask you. And after we got married, I remember him saying, he used to say to me, do you still love her? Do you still love her? And, uh, and of course, I had to say yes. And, uh, and then he'd shake Susan's hand and he'd say, do you still love him? And, and, and that's how he always welcomed you. Do you still love him? Do you still love her? And that was great. And... Um, Welcomes are important, aren't they? That made us feel important. And uh, sometimes you had to prepare what you were going to say because you knew what he was going to ask you. <laughs> and uh, I don't think you had to tell him any lies. Sometimes you had to say, well, we've had a rough week. Maybe, maybe never mind. Um, welcomes are so important. But I wondered what would happen if I came up to you and I shook your hand and I said, do you still love Jesus? How much do you love Jesus? And if I came up to Derek, I was thinking about this, and I thought, if I came up to Derek and shook his hand and said, good morning, Derek, do you still love Jesus? Oh, how I love Jesus. There you go. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. There we go. Hey, how about that? How many of you would have that song in your heart? Eh? We've been singing earlier there that Jesus sings over us. Isn't that a lovely thought? He sings over us. He sung over us when we were in our mother's womb. Jesus sings over us. Such is his love. And I thought we'd do something a little bit different this week. And I'm going to play you a, a video. Uh, well, the, the team are going to play a video and it's a song that we sung quite a lot during the summer. And it really struck me about God's love for us. So listen to this and just look at the words in particular.
There now, that was silence, wasn't it, at the end? What do you think about that? How does that make you feel about God's love? Because often when you say to someone, why do you love Jesus? Their reply is, because he died on a cross for us. But there's more to God's love than that, isn't there? There's more to God's love. God's love extends to us every day. It isn't just something he did 2,000 years ago that makes us want to love him. It's the things he does day by day by day for us. When we get answered prayer, when we hear of Peter being um, healed of, of cancer, we just want to love Jesus more because of what he's done for us. Because that's his nature is to love us. Those words we saw there, the next slide, guys, is um, the next one. There we go. Look at some of the words up there. The things that they, they sung there, that we don't deserve his love, and yet he gives us his love. We haven't earned it. We haven't done anything to, 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 to gain God's love, but he pours his love out on us. Uh, we couldn't earn it. It's overwhelming love. He breathed life into us. 
It's a reckless love. Some people think reckless. If I drove my car recklessly down the road, uh, I went to pick Mary up this morning, and when we were driving back to, uh, to Lumley, there was a guy on a, a, mort- on a, a push bike. He was an older guy, and, um, and just as I was going up the road, he decided he wanted to drive on the other, uh, to cycle on the other side of the road, and he sort of swerved to the other side of the road. And I thought, well, this is interesting because there's cars coming the other way. And, um, and when the car came the other way, he sort of went into the dike and started driving along the side. That was reckless driving, wasn't it? And when I look back in my mirror, he was still riding his cycle on the wrong side of the road. Uh, maybe, he's, I don't know, maybe he was from another country, I don't know. But, uh, but that was reckless. But we can't describe God's love as reckless. We can't say that his love for us is reckless. But we've been singing there, his reckless love. And it just means he's just so anxious, he's so keen, he's so uh, desiring to pour out his love on us. When you look in the song there, it says he seeks out the one of the 99, out of the one of the 100, doesn't he? He leaves the 99 to go and look for the one that was lost. Now, most people would say that was a reckless shepherd, leaving 99. Why not look after the 99? But Jesus says he goes to seek and to save that which is lost, the one that was lost. It's a reckless love. He just wants to pour out his love on us. And that's just amazing. It just When I've heard, been listening to that song and been reading it, I've just been filled with a greater love for God, for who he is and what he wants to do for us on a daily basis. Let's look at Psalm 46. Psalm 46, if you want to read it in your Bible, It's roughly in the middle somewhere. Uh, Psalm 46. It's coming up on the screen. Yeah, good. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall. Sorry, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar, and form, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the the city of God, the holy place, where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob, is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spears. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Almighty, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. So even there, written back in the Psalms, we see that God was ever present with them, no matter what circumstances they faced. And I want to talk about just that verse there where it says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. In a busy world, it's hard to be still, isn't it? I thought when I retired that I'd have loads of spare time and I could order my day where, you know, at certain times I'd sit down and go and do my Bible reading and I'd have time for prayer. But suddenly life just fills in with other things. It's like, um, you know, you 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 haven't got work, but everything else just sucks in and, and, and takes time. And I find, honestly, I struggle to find time to be still and know God. Even though I'm retired, those of you who are retired probably have the same problem of finding time to be still. But this be still that they're talking about here isn't a be still and have a nice time. Let's go off to um, a health spa and just chill and swim in the nice water and lie on the side of the bed and sit down. It's not that sort of be still. It's not be still and be tranquil. It's be still in the sense of stop doing what you're doing and be still and trust God. If you imagine um, 
you're driving along in the car and you've got the kids. Maybe you can remember those days when they're sitting in the back of the car, when all my, uh, the kids are together, the grandkids in the back of the car, and they start squabbling. And they're going on and on and on. And you're trying to drive. And you get to that point. Now, don't tell me you've never done this. Where you just turn around and you go, Will you shut up? Or I'm going to bang your heads together. Eh? Have you ever done that? Have you ever banged their heads together? Well, never mind. We'll not talk about that. But will you just shut up? It's that sort of be still. Be still. And um, one of the writers said it's a bit like, you know, when you think about when Jesus talked about the, uh, the storm, uh, he, he, he had a busy day preaching to the, to the people, and they got in the boat, and uh, he went to sleep because he was tired and weary, and the disciples were there, and the storm blew up, and um, the disciples got fearful and frightened, didn't they? And they got to that point where they woke Jesus up. And, you know, he, we hear those words he said, he stood up and he said, be still. Now, sometimes I wonder, was he actually talking to the storm or was he talking to the disciples? Because I can imagine he woke up and he went, what are you worrying about? Don't be so silly. I'm in the boat. Don't you realize God's in control of this situation? So when he went, be still, I think he was addressing the disciples because later on he says, where was your faith? Where was your faith? And so in this be still we're talking about here, it's a be still is stop being anxious. Stop being concerned about the things that are going on and take notice of who I am. Take notice of me as God. And, and there was a fearful thing there to be taken notice of as well because we forget that, you know, we've got a God of awe. If, if it's our creator God and he made us, uh, he's an awesome God and we need to take notice of what he says. So when he tells us to be still, we need to take notice. Often we're not still because we're chewing things over, aren't we? We've got things, um, I've got to confess, in the recent months I've been waking up at four o'clock in the morning and worrying about the stupidest of things. Have you ever done that? Anybody ever done that? My solution is to go downstairs, make a Horlicks, have a Horlicks, and then go back to bed again. And usually I sleep after that. But when I think about the things that I wake up worrying about, they're absolutely ridiculous. Nothing yet you could do about them in the middle of the night at four o'clock in the morning. Um, and that, and that's, that's not right. Be still and know that I am God. When we were at Soul Survivor uh, this year, we had an incredible time. The first week was uh, uh, an adult camp. With, uh, it was naturally supernatural. It was an amazing time. And Susan and I were working on the Connect team. Now, the Connect team is, um, is, is quite a hard team to work on, I've got to say, because it's, it's not the people who um, just need prayer. It's not the people who just need somebody to chat to. It's people who've got some really deep-rooted, difficult situations to deal with. And um, it, it, it's quite hard, and we work long hours and, uh, to deal with things. But we got to the end of the week, and uh, it was the last night, and I remember in the hall, uh, 5,000 people there, and um, we were, Susan and I were sitting right at the side, just sort of almost on our own, just one or two other people around us, probably just a few families with little kids crawling around and, and watching what was going on. And, and I was tired. And when you're tired, that's when the devil has a go at you, isn't it? And just questions who you are, questions your relationship with God, and questions all the things that are going on in your life. And, um, and I remember just saying to God, I don't really know why I'm here. Why have I come this week? What's this all about, God? What's going on? And God, in his love and in his mercy, he spoke to me quite clearly. And as I looked out, and it was a bit like looking out here in the semi-dark, he just pointed out people in the crowd that I'd worked with during the week, that I'd spent time with during the week, people who'd shared their lives with me during the week, and who people where God had ministered to them. He pointed out a young lad 
who I'd spoken to early in the week. And the young lad came from a troubled family and his prayer, God had convicted him that he didn't need to go back and join the gang that he was under pressure from his peers. And he said to me, I've got up to a lot of trouble. I've done a lot of things wrong. I've done all sorts of stuff. And he says, I don't want to go back to that. And so we talked about how we might have a different strategy. He said he was going to a different school. So we talked about how he might be able to change and not get back. When those guys rang up to get him to go back into the gang, um, how we could do something different by saying no to them and making new friends. So somewhere along the line, God helped him and now was part of that. That was a privilege. He pointed out a youth leader who was really struggling because a number of his youth group were disclosing to him that they'd been abused when they were children. And he didn't know how to cope with it emotionally. He couldn't cope with it himself. So I was able to talk to him about that. He pointed out in the crowd a guy, an older guy, by older I mean in his late 20s, who had been involved in spiritualism and Ouija boards, and he was in a right mess. And, and actually, he allowed demons to come into his life. And we spent a lot of time with him, casting out demons, and now he was completely free. And God pointed out, look, you were part of that change in his life. And God pointed out somebody quite close to where I was sitting who was a married man with two small children who would actually, when he was there, God had convicted him that he needed to tell his wife that he'd been in an adulterous relationship. And he confessed that to me. I was the first person he told about that. And we prayed about it and put plans in place to help him keep away from that situation, to get over that situation. And he pointed out a young man who was completely absorbed in watching pornography on his computer. And, um, and we were able to talk about things that that guy could do to keep himself safe and to stop him getting back into that routine of doing stuff. Wasn't God's love just amazing? And, and after that, I was, I was tearful, but I just felt what a privilege to be part of what God's doing. But God so loved each one of those people that he brought about a change. And God loved me enough to let me be part of that. And that was just an immense responsibility. Sometimes if we just be still, God can speak to us in an amazing way. Be still and know that I am God. How many times do we just need to remind ourselves? How many times do we need to just keep that in our heads? It said, and I had to correct this, Terry. I'm going to, you'll know why I'm saying that, Terry. I had to correct this. It says that we have 50,000 thoughts a day. Now, Terry, I kind of think that might just be women who have 50,000 thoughts because us men probably don't have that many because we have all that nothing time, don't we? So we probably lose out a bit on that. But it says we have 50,000 thoughts a day. And the, the Scripture says that we're to take control of our thoughts. So we're not allowed not allow those thoughts that will corrupt us or distract us to be there. And one way of doing that is just being still and know that we are God. We're to, we're to, we're to fight against those thoughts that would distract us and destroy us and remember that God loves us. So today, I just really want to leave with you the idea that God loves us more than we can ever imagine. More, more than just sending, just sounds an understatement, doesn't it? More than sending his son to die on a cross. He loves us every day with an overwhelming love. His desire is to be with us. His desire is to be with us and talk to us and encourage us and love us to bits. But the only way we can do that is if we be still and come before Him. Be still and come before Him. I just thought we'd end today with just a little time of quiet 
And we're not going to do anything dramatic. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or run to the front, come to the front. But I just want us to be still. And first of all, in our stillness, just put down those things that are hindering you, those things that are distracting you, that really you just need to say, God, you've got control over this. Why, why am I worrying about it? Why am I upset? Why am I angry with somebody else? Why am I letting somebody else's hard words hurt me? Just leave go of those things. Be still. And just let God speak to you. Let God come to you. So we're going to pray now. And, and all I'm going to ask you to do is, while we're praying quietly, the group are going to come back up and um, going to start singing. And while we're doing that, if you just, just as an acknowledgement to God, not to anybody else, but just as an acknowledgement to God that you want to be still and trust Him and accept His love, I just want you to just put your hand up like that for one, two seconds, and then put it down again. That's all I want you to do when we're praying. Can the group come back up, please? Can't see where you're at, but can you come back up to... Uh, Once they're back up here, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start to pray. Oh, Father, we come before you now and we just acknowledge you as God. And we just thank you for your overwhelming love that just wants to pour down on us. Lord, in the stillness now, can we just come before you and acknowledge who you are and just acknowledge your love for us and trust you for the future, trust you for eternity, trust you for our daily lives. Pour your blessing out on us now. Pour your spirit out now. Bless us, Lord. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.